All right, online students here. Let me uh, just double check to make my microphones on and say, all right, let's go ahead here and run a, a lab. I kind of forgot now what number this is. This might be five. Uh, I want to say five. I bet it is five. Uh, and it's the centripetal force one. And so in the lecture, we just got done with chapter six. And so hopefully you're watching chapter six before now. I uh, suppose it doesn't uh, really matter. Uh, hopefully you're done with the exam. But as we get here in chapter six, here's what we have learned. We learned that the acceleration of an object as it is turning has to equal v squared over r. That was the first half of chapter six. That was the big piece. Because if we put that together with Newton's second law, It says if you add up all the forces on an object, they must equal the mass times the velocity squared over the radius. So here's how we're going to do today's lab. Today's lab, we are going to run an experiment that only has one force on the object. And I should say, only one horizontal force because we are going to measure this and in a second here I'll show you the equipment this force is coming from a spring and so as we take our object and spin it while it is spinning we're gonna measure this we're going to say, how much force are you getting? Because also, while it's spinning, we're going to measure, measure and I'll say measure, but we're really going to measure how much time for one revolution and then figure out a calculation. But I want to call that measured for just a second so you can kind of see the big picture. The big picture here is to verify if this equation is correct. Uh, because as I, I said in chapter six, your author does a good job of proving this. So I did not. But in the lab here, I'll be your hands and I'll let you do the calculations and the graphs you, your job is then to verify, based on the data that I'm going to help you collect, does this force here match, and that is, does it equal that? And so that's why, while it's spinning, we're going to measure all of these and also all of these. Well, I'll talk more about the theory in a second, but this might be a good time to look at the equipment. And so the equipment, you will see a picture of it on your lab sheet I'm sending to you. And this is a, a pretty big lab sheet today. There's four pages. And this first one has a photograph of this contraption that I want to share with you. All right. So let me actually show you the equipment. Because there's a lot of moving pieces here. And of course, that's what we need. And of course, I'll be your hands to make it spin. And I want you to put your attention right here on this brass weight. This is the object that will spin. But I also want you to see all these other pieces. And so I'll uh, kind of just make sure Ron pans back a little so they can see everything here. But I'm just going to put my hand underneath it and slowly bring it up to speed. And what I hope you begin to see, I'll let it go, 
is that little brass weight is going in a circle. Now, let me stop it so you can kind of see what I'm going to try to do here. And I don't know if you could see when I was spinning it. I would say I first was spinning it too fast. I spin it so fast that this brass weight was actually out here. And then as it slowed down, it was here. And then as it slowed down, it was here. Now, when it is this far out, that is not where I want to take the data. And the reason why is if you look at the string, this vertical string, right now it is not straight up and down. But right about here somewhere, and I can't really tell from my angle, but I'm close. Right about here, this string is straight up and down. And I'm claiming then that the only thing pulling this weight horizontally, follow the string, it comes up to this spring. And there it is. This is the tension that will be pulling on it when this weight is right about there. Also, I want you to notice when it's right about here, notice how the fluorescent disc is kind of at this plate. That's going to be my indicator and your indicator, because you'll be watching it, that I'm at the correct position. Because when this thing is spinning, you can't really see the string straight up and down, but you can see the fluorescent disc really well. So as it's spinning here, I would say it's spinning too fast. It's moving the weight out. Right now would be a good time, and now it's too slow. And I can tell that by the fluorescent disc. See how the fluorescent disc right now is a little too high. That's, that's too slow. But if I speed it up again, and look at that fluorescent disc right there, it is <laughs> too low. And right now it's perfect. And now it's too slow. Okay, so let me just kind of stop it here. Our job together, I'll be your hands, is when it is at that magical spot right here, we collect our data. Okay? So let me help you with the data. I'm going to start with the easiest one. In fact, the, one, the first one is so easy, the author has typed it in for you. You don't even have to input it. So looking at our data sheet, what would be the radius? And your author types 12 centimeters. And we're going to actually perform this experiment, as you can see, six times. Okay, this is what we're filling in and turning in. You're going to turn in this, and I'll show you a graph. So there's two sheets you're going to turn in, this and a graph. Now, I'll say it again. On this one, while it's spinning, we want to get the, the radius. And the reason I say that one is easy, not just because the author typed it in, but if I take the data when it's right here, there's a little scale down here, and I have actually set this string right at 12 centimeters. And so that's how I know the radius is 12 centimeters. And that's how the author typed it in, so that you would even have to bother to mess with what the radius is. All right, so I'll say it again. Of all of these things we need to measure, in fact, maybe I should come back over here. How many do we need to measure? I guess it is one, two, three, four things. This first one is the, the radius. All right. Now, I will pause here and point out, though, you should input it into your calculations as 0.12 meters, okay? Because we'll be measuring force in newtons. And remember, a newton is a kilogram and a meter per second squared. All right. Okay, well, if you're good with that one, let me move on. This pen's getting kind of dry. Maybe I'll switch over to a blue one here. Let me give you the next easiest one to measure, mass. 
because I can just measure that right now. And when it starts spinning, it's still going to have the same mass. So looking at my data sheet, you will see that there is a place at the very top that you can write down the mass of your little spinny weight. Okay? I will point out that you should probably write this down in kilograms. Because like I just said, we're going to be measuring forces. We're going to be measuring forces in Newtons. And a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So the units inside are a kilogram. I say that because I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to your hands. I'm going to walk over here and help you get the mass, but our scale reads in grams. So I'm going to give it to you in grams. You need to convert it to kilograms, and you need to use that in your calculation. So, okay. Let me unhook this thing from the different strings. Let me walk over here and place it on the scale. And this says it is 208.8 grams. In fact, why don't I write that on the board? Just so that you don't have to write it down from words. The little m is 208.8 .8 grams. Let me also point out, move the decimal three, let's write it in kilograms. All right, let's bring it back because those are the two easy ones to measure. The next to last easy one, still this is kind of the hard one, is how much tension are you getting from that spring? Well, let me turn it towards you again and remind you when this is spinning, and I'll, maybe I'll just spin it one more time so you can get a good feel for this. So as it is spinning, right now, Spinning too fast, right now is perfect. Now it's too slow. But when it's spinning, the spring will be stretched right to here. And the fluorescent disc will be in this location. And so really I'm asking, how much tension do I get from the spring when it stretches this far? And it's probably easier to measure that when it's not spinning. So that's why I have this little pulley over here on the end. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take another set of weights right here. This, by the way, happens to be 50 grams. And maybe I'll angle it a little more towards you, but I gotta make sure I have enough room off the edge of the table so I can put some tension on here. I'm going to hook this up and give it some tension. Oh, good idea, Ron. See, because now I would say that the amount of tension from this spring is equal to the mass I am hanging. Now, you can see in the camera that's not enough, right? I, I did not pull it enough to move the fluorescent disc down to this bottom plate because it's got to pull it right to about here before it's straight up and down. So, I would either A, have to put more weight on here or B, reduce the strength of the spring in order to match the weights. And that's the direction I'm gonna go. What I'm gonna do is lower this top plate until my fluorescent disc is right in here. That'll make this go up and down but this is my way, and your way, of saying 
the tension from this spring when I spin it will be equal to the weight of 50 grams hanging. And this is your first calculation. So, what you need to do, this is going to be your job, I'm not going to do this for you, this is your job, is right here when it says the tension from the spring, how much force are you getting from the spring, you need to calculate that in newtons. So you can see right here, we're going to run this first row where it says adjust the spring until you have the equivalent attention, tension of 50 grams. Now I will help you with the equation, let me walk over here and kind of help you with this equation, but this tension then would be the capital M times G, and in this first case it would be 0 0.050 kilograms. That's the 50 grams I have hanging. And then times 9.8 meters per second squared. And so half of 9.8 is 4.9. And it's not really a half, it's another decimal. So 0.49 newtons would be your first calculation. And I guess I said I wasn't going to do it for you and I did the first one. My bad. All right, but I wanted you to see how you're going to get the tension from the spring. And we're going to be changing that many times. All right, so at this point, I would say I have the easy stuff. When I start spinning this, I have, when it's at the right spot, I know what the tension from the spring is, I know what the mass is, I know what the radius is. The hard thing is to get the velocity and we're going to do that by getting the period. Uh, watch. For that I'm going to use the computer. So I'll need to remove this hanging weight that is used to calibrate the tension from the spring. And before I turn the computer back on, I'm just going to spin it one more time and point out, okay, right there is a spin that is too fast. And as it slows down, I'd like to make a measurement right there, and now it's too slow. And our equipment has that photo gate that you've seen twice already, once for the picket fence and then again for the smart pulley. And so this is the third time seeing the little photo gate. It might be a little hard on the camera to see. The photo gate is down here and this little disc has spokes in it so the computer can measure the rate at which the little infrared beam is being chopped as it spins around. And the computer then, right here in this column, is going to display the period. In fact, maybe I'll just do a quick run of it. So I'm going to spin it. And uh, why don't I just kind of start with a spin that is too fast. I'll just hit the collect button, collect. And it's measuring the period. It's too fast, although right now that's the one I want and now it's too slow. <laughs> so there's one more little trick I need to do and that is how do I get the right one out of all of these periods and that's the time for one revolution. How do I get the right one? Ah, well, you're going to see me do this. And I got to get the computer and the mouse a little closer. But when I get to the right moment, I'm going to block with my index finger the infrared beam. And the infrared beam's down here on that photo gate. So I'm just going to move it right over the beam. You'll see my hand motion kind of looks like this. I'm going to right over the beam. 
And when I go right over the beam, then the computer will say, I can't collect anything more. And so the data I want would be the last one. Actually, it'll be the second to last one because the last one will be my finger blocking the beam. That's what the computer will pick up and say, okay, how quickly was it blocked? So I'm going to ignore the last one, but the second to last one would be the right one. All the other ones would be too fast. Watch, let, let, let's take our first period here. All right, so here we go. I'm going to get it spinning. And I'm going to get it spinning too fast. Okay, there's too fast. I'm going to hit collects, and I have about 20 seconds of data. Too fast, too fast, too fast, right now. And I put my finger over it. And then I'll hit stop. And then let's take a look at this chart. It graphed the period. You can see that it started at a low period and kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it started with a period of about 1.2 and got bigger and bigger. That means it was slowing down, right? It's taking longer to go all the way around. The period is the time to go all the way around. So as the period gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it, it, that's saying it's slowing down, it's slowing down. I'm not going to try to read the number off the graph. I'll just get it off the data table. So I'm just going to scroll down right there. Second to last one. So second to last one, 1.377. That's the number I need to share with you. Let me kind of copy this table here. Here's R. And it's this symbol right here. T in seconds is what I just measured. One point, oh I forgot what it was again. 1.377. 377 seconds. How is that going to help me get the velocity in units of meters per second? Now, this is the calculation I'm going to let you do. But velocity is this distance divided by time. What is the distance? Well, the time is one revolution. It's a period. How much time does it take for one revolution? So the distance must be the circumference of a circle. And going back to your math class, you hopefully you learned the... Oh, yeah. I want to make sure my uh, light was still on there. I heard a little glitch. Okay. I want to make sure then... We good, Ron? Yeah. Okay. That... Uh, I'm sorry. I was saying... So go back to your math class. This would be the circumference and then this would be the time. So take your calculator, and I, I'm very tempted, but I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to let you. Here's a calculator. And put in these numbers, and let me remind you that the radius is 0.12 meters. By the way, we set up the equipment. So everything we do today, because I set it up that way with the posts spread out 12 centimeters apart, the radius is 12 centimeters. So get your calculator, go 2 pi r, divide by the period, and you're going to get a number right there. Now we can calculate the mv squared over r, which is called the centripetal force. So the mass is up here at the top in kilograms. Remember I told you it was 208.8 grams. So convert it to kilograms. The speed you just got, the radius you've gotten, and so see what you get. And we'll do the rest of them here together, but I'm hoping that this number right here, this mv squared over r, is very close 
to the tension in the spring. Because that's what we're trying to prove. That's what we're trying to verify. That, that's what the whole experiment is about. Is it true that mv squared over r is equal to all the forces when an object goes in a circle? And so maybe continuing the chart here, you have right here force from the spring and you have that point 49 newtons right there. And so does this match that? Which brings me to the last calculation in the column. The last calculation is a calculation that's trying to say how close are these two numbers? What is their percent difference? Now, that might be a formula you're not familiar with. So let me help you with that. Uh, I'll do it maybe, let's see, in a red color. But if I was comparing two numbers, let's just say I'm trying to compare F of a spring with F centripetal, okay? I shouldn't say let's pretend. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Okay, you have those two. And so you have this one here, and you have this one here. And you want to know a number here that says, are they close? And so please remember, they will not be exactly the same. Every time we run a scientific experiment, we always say, they will be close. Nature meant for them to be exactly the same. But because we as humans always make small errors. I mean, I know you don't, but I did. So I'm, you know, I probably made some small errors here. These will not come out to be exactly the same. But if our percentage is close, and with our simple equipment, we like to say, well, what's close? Oh, you know, well, how about 10%? All right. So if those two numbers are within 10%, we prefer under 5%, we say they really are equal in nature, we just didn't get them to look like they were equal because we as humans made a few mistakes along our measurements. We don't have the perfect equipment and we don't have the perfect calculations and there's just always little mistakes here. But they hopefully are the little and they're enough to prove our uh, way of nature behaves. So with that in mind, how do you do a comparison? Well, what you do is you subtract the two so that's why it's called a difference. And since it's an error, we don't know which one is going to be high and which one's going to be low. So we just do the absolute value. So we don't, we don't care which one's high, which one's low. We just say, okay, they differ by a little bit, hopefully. But to make it a percentage, we got to compare it to something, right? A percentage is part over the whole. So this is the part that we don't match by. The whole would be, well, we need to divide it by something. And one answer is to say, well, divide it by the correct one. But we don't know which one is correct. In fact, if we knew which one was correct, we would divide by the correct one, and we wouldn't call it a percent difference. We would call it a percent error. But this is a percent difference. So I'm going to say this. Divide by their average. And so just to remind you, how do you calculate an average? Well, the average of two numbers, it means you add them together and divide by two. All right. And you might want to do those as separate calculations. First, subtract them and save that number. Uh, then get their average and save that number. But then, to make it a percentage, you multiply it by 100. And so this is the little formula that, again, I won't calculate for you. I want you to do that. That's the part I want you to do at home. And hopefully, like I said, that number is under 10%. Even better still, hopefully it's under 5%. So that you will be convinced that the force applied on the mass, that's the force coming from the spring, 
is actually equal to this calculation of mv squared over r that we've been doing in chapter 6. All right, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and do this a second time, and then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and finally a sixth. So, what do we need to do first? Well, let's come over here and make some adjustments. Because over here, we had just run this experiment where we adjusted the tension for 50 grams. Let's do it all again with a new tension of 60 grams. And this time, I will not do it. But I need you to take the mass of the 60 grams, so it'll be 0.06, Multiply it by 9.8, get a number, and put it in this box saying this will be the force from the spring. What I will do is calibrate it for that, okay? So I will make sure that the spring is calibrated for that number. You need to calculate it. Then, of course, we'll spin it and we will get this mv squared over r. And of course, to get that, you got to get velocity. And to get that, you got to get the period. And so hopefully the period that I'm about to measure will be smaller, meaning it's spinning faster, which means the centripetal force is greater because this number is greater. But then you'll still compare how does the force from the spring compare with the force of mv squared over r. That percent difference is going to go right there. All right, so again, you need to fill in this table, but I'll be your hand. So let me come over here. Let me then do a new calibration. So I'm going to come over here. Here's this 50 gram hanger. Let me put 10 more grams on it. And so let me find a 10 gram. Here we go. So now I'll be hanging 60 grams. I'm going to hook it on. And that should pull it so that the fluorescent disc is a little bit underneath it. Remember, because we had already calibrated it for 50. And so now this is a little bit higher. So I need to readjust the tension in my spring. And I can do that by lifting up on this plate. So I'm going to lift up on the top plate. And so now when the fluorescent disc is in the middle, the spring is giving me a tension of 60. So now I can just run this again with more tension on it. All right, well, let's give it a try. Let me take off this little calibrating weight. We'll need that a few times. Let me get it spinning to the point that it's spinning too fast. Let me get my index finger ready. Let me hit the collect button on the computer. And let me watch the fluorescent disc. It's spinning too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. Ooh, right there. And now I'll just cover it. I'll hit stop. I will now scroll down to the bottom of my chart. I will then take the second to last. So second to last is 0.3 or 1.300 seconds and that's the number I'll do for you and I'll say it again then what you need to do is use that and this idea of velocity to get a number here to then get a number here and then to get a number here compare those two okay Let's move on down to 70, 70 grams, 80 grams, 90 
grams. And finally, 100 grams. And so let me recalibrate that spring for each of these higher tensions and let me then put the time in this chart so that you can fill out the rest of the chart and then again be convinced hopefully that the centripetal force equals this mv squared over r. Alright, so let's go new calibration. Off to 70 grams. All right, so let me grab some of these little weights. Um, it looks like I have a 20 here. So if I just put a 20 on the 50, that makes 70. Let me turn it to the side. Let me hook it on here. And say the same thing as last time. Notice how it has pulled it so that the fluorescent disc is a little bit lower. Makes sense because fluorescent disc should be there when you're tugging it with 60 grams. And now I'm tugging it with 70 grams. So let me add some tension here. So I'm going to increase the force from the spring. Alright, so now when the little fluorescent disc is in the center, it would be tugging with the equivalent of 70 grams. Okay, so let me take this off and spin it, although before I spin it, maybe I'll walk over here and then just point out, make sure you do that calculation. This is how much force, and of course change grams into kilograms, this is how much force you get when it's spinning. And I will measure the time it takes to spin so that you can get the velocity and then the centripetal force and then see how they compare. Alright, so here we go. I'll get it moving up pretty fast. Alright, so there's too fast. And I'll get my index finger ready. And I'll hit collect. I'll watch it. Oh, getting close, getting close. And right there, I'll put my finger over it and hit stop. And again, second to last one. Oh, you can really see where my finger broke the beam. See how much? Well, that's not too much lower. But it's it went lower instead of getting getting higher. See, higher, 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 and then, so again, I'm not going to trust that last one. That last one is my finger breaking the beam, but the one before that, the 1.197. All right, so 1.197 is the period with this tension, and you do those calculations. All right, let's do three more together here, and then we'll talk about the graph. Okay, so let's calibrate it to 80. Alright, so let me just put, this feels kind of heavy, is this a 10? It does say 10. Okay, I guess they're the same. Alright, so here is the 80. And I'll make the same comment, notice how it pulls the fluorescent disc a little further. So I'm going to rise up with the tension. There we go. So now when it's spinning, it's going to have a larger force from the spring, which of course means I'm going to have to be spinning it faster, which of course means the period should be less. And so you'll see the period keeps dropping down. All right, so let me get it spinning now. You know, I'll say spinning too fast. Let me put my index finger on it. Let me hit collect and watch it. Okay, still too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. And right now, looks good. So I'll cover it and hit stop and scroll down and get a useful number. Again, not the last one. That's my finger breaking the beam, but 1.117. So 1 1.117. Is the time. All right, again, second to last time, let's calibrate it for 90. All right, so I've got two 
20s and the hanger, so that's 90. And I'll hook it on. And probably notice the fluorescent disc. It's a little bit lower than my bottom plate, so I'll lift up my top plate. Right about there. I'll then unhook this. And say, let's try it again. So now that we're at 90, I'll give it a spin. I'll have to give it a really good spin now. So spinning faster. I'll hit the collect. Too fast, too fast, too fast. Right there. And I'll hit stop. And I'll scroll down. And the second to last is 1.056. So 1.056 seconds for that one. All right. Now for the last one, I think this is 50 grams. Yeah, so I'll just put the, the 50 on the 50. So there is 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms, which that one I can multiply in my head. So that would be a force of 0.98 newtons. And so let's calibrate it. Okay. And again, one last time, lifting it up. And one last time, collecting the period. So faster, 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 faster. Okay, too fast. Hits, collects, and watch it. All right, too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. Right there. And so I will hit stop. Scroll down, second to the last one is 1.001. All right. Now you have one more thing, which is a graph, but I'm just going to say one more time, your job is to take these numbers now that you've seen what's going on and well, I'll be your hands and hopefully you understand. Our goal is to see does the force pulling on an object equal mv squared over r when it's going in a circle? And the force pulling on it was that spring while well, it was going in a circle. And so hopefully all of these percent differences are kind of on the small side. Definitely, hopefully they're under 10%. 5% would be even better. All right. So I'm assuming you got those numbers. Here's the second page you're going to turn in. It's a graph. And so let's talk about the graph. I'll come over here where there's a little more space now. Let's me then put a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Let me also put down this equation. The force from the spring should be equal to mv squared over r. Now you calculated all those percent differences, so at this point you're probably saying, yeah, they kind of did. We're just going to do the same thing. What you're asked to do, now let me just confirm this in the instructions, yeah. You are asked to plot on the vertical axis the force from the spring. So this is where you're probably going to turn off your, oh, excuse me, I'm going to say turn off your Logger Pro. You, you, I'm going to turn off the Logger Pro for you. You never had it on. So let me come over here and turn off my Logger Pro. 
So here's my Logger Pro. And I'm going to turn it off. And you need to start graphical analysis. Or some other graphing programming. But like I said, I'm going to teach it from graphical analysis because we have it on the virtual desktop and it's so easy to do curve fits. Okay. So I'm going to start graphical analysis and what I would ask you to type in is the force from the spring right here in the Y column. It's also an important idea to change the title to the force from the spring. Okay? So that goes on the vertical axis. Now, here's something that might look a little weird at first, but I hope this helps. Plot velocity squared on the x-axis. Notice I didn't say velocity. So what you're going to need to do before you can even type them in is take your data for velocity these six times, put it into your calculator, square it, and now you can type in velocity squared. Okay? And so that goes into the x column. Hopefully you will get something that looks like this. Roughly a straight line. Here's why. If you let me rewrite this so it's kind of easier to see. And you think about velocity squared as the x and the force from the spring as the y and this right here as then the line of the, excuse me, the slope of a line. This equation is the equation of a line. And I know when you see velocity squared, sometimes you go, well, that's a squared. Isn't that a parabola? No, it's a parabola if you plot velocity. But it's a line if you plot velocity squared. You see the difference? Because once you plot velocity squared, you don't really have a square anymore. You are plotting the square. So, if you get a straight line, when you plot velocity squared, I would say you are now proving that the force from the spring is proportional to the square of the velocity. And that's what this equation says. So I would say you are confirming the equation a second time. In other words, you're confirming it by a graph. I would say you've already kind of confirmed it when you did the percent differences. But that was individual data points. Now collectively, as a total of six data points, the, if you get a straight line, you are confirming that the force needed to push an object in a circle is equal to velocity squared. All right. So, what are you going to turn into canvas? Two pieces of paper. This graph, okay, which you can do on graphical analysis or any other way and save as a PDF or do a screenshot. Or if you can't do a screenshot, get your camera out and just take an actual picture of the screen. Because I know some of you have been struggling with getting it from the virtual desktop. All right. But if you print this with the options I said, uh, that Microsoft print, maybe I'll even show it again. And so I'll go to File, Print Graph, uh, put your name here. But if you select then Microsoft Print to PDF, when you click OK, It'll come back with a little dialog box and say, well, where do you want me to save it? And you choose it. 
I would recommend the desktop. But remember, that is the desktop of your virtual machine, not your home machine. And then, of course, it's going to make it a PDF. And so then you can turn it in. You still got to get it off your virtual desktop, which means you can either start Canvas in the virtual desktop and just load it up right there, or you can email it to yourself. And you probably have to email it to yourself this time because remember, you got two pieces of paper and this is only one of them. The other one is this one here. And so I'm going to send this to you in electronic form. You can either print it out and write by hand and rescan it or whatever you want to do, but you need to fill in this table. And so those are your two sheets to turn in. This table and the graph. So, good luck. We'll see you next one. Bye.